As the coronavirus pandemic unfolds, people across the globe are stocking up on food and staying inside. But they're also doing something else. So why do we turn to prayer in times of crisis? First, we should try to explain what exactly is prayer. Prayer in practice can vary so much. This is my friend and colleague, Carol Caravella. She's a reporter covering religion at HuffPost. Like me, Carol is also working from her home. I asked her about different types of prayer she's encountered in her reporting. In some traditions, it's very individual, spontaneous. It's a natural conversation. It can include glossolalia, which is um, speaking in tongues sometimes. It can be the repetition of a single phrase that is very powerful, that brings you into a meditative state. And yet, while prayer itself can vary widely, all prayer tends to have one thing in common. At its core, prayer is that human impulse to reach out to something that is bigger than you, that is universal, that is timeless. Now, the earliest examples of prayer go back thousands of years. Yet as ancient as it is, the human impulse towards prayer hasn't gone anywhere. There's actually like really cool stats about that. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. According to a Pew Research poll, more than half of all American adults, 55%, say that they have prayed for an end to the spread of the coronavirus. And this isn't just limited to faith adherence. In fact, 24% of people who say that they don't belong to any religious tradition have also turned to prayer. So that's a quarter of people who don't have any religion and say that they have prayed for an end to the virus. Okay, but why? Let me just see if, uh, yeah. I, I guess, this, is this a good height? This is Dr. Andrew Newberg, a physician at the Department of Integrative Medicine and Nutritional Sciences at Thomas Jefferson University. He's also one of the leading researchers in the emerging field of neurotheology. Simplistically put, neurotheology is the field of scholarship that looks at the link or relationship between our brain and our religious and spiritual selves. Dr. Newberg conducts his research by examining people's brains in the moment of prayer. Ultimately, we, we do all of this work by studying a group of people who do a particular practice. We scan their brains during the practice and then during some comparison state. But it turns out our brains don't just change during prayer, but after prayer as well. When people do these practices, it helps them to regulate their emotional responses. It helps them to reduce their levels of stress and anxiety and depression, which can all be very valuable and very helpful for people. And it also helps to improve the way people think cognitively. And according to Dr. Newberg's research, anyone can benefit from prayer. A lot of practices have been very secularized. So the whole mindfulness uh, groups and programs that are out there today, they're not based on any specific tradition. And yet, while neurotheology might help us better understand how prayer strengthens us as individuals, so much of prayer is about strengthening us collectively. Okay, cool. I'm going to exit out of my Slack because I think it'll just won't shut up. This is my friend and colleague, Roweda Abdelaziz. She's a national reporter covering Islamophobia and social justice issues at HuffPost. Okay, do that. I don't want that to be in the background. Okay. In her reporting on the Muslim community, Roweda has encountered the important role prayer holds in building a sense of togetherness. And so it's very communal in that sense, especially leading up to Ramadan, the holy month where Muslims are going to embark on fasting from dawn to dusk. Prayer is another important concept, so people tend to flock to the mosque where easily some mosques can have up to thousands of people and they pray together. So you're doing the physical motions together. And yet this year, prayer during Ramadan has been different. There have been so many religious scholars and people who study theology who are updating and telling people, okay, we're in different times, we're in tense times, this is how prayer adapts. So prayer is not just this rigid thing, it is also adaptable. And this isn't just true for the Muslim community. As the coronavirus keeps communities of faith apart, prayer helps keep them together. 
it's that same human impulse, whether it's a thousand years ago or today, when, when you look up at the stars on a clear night, or you're looking at the vastness of an ocean, or you're huddled down while facing a raging storm, you get a sense of how small you are in the grand scheme of things, and also how precious life is, like what a miracle it is that we even exist. And perhaps in that sense, Prayer tells us as much about the human capacity for faith as it does about the human capacity for hope. I think prayer in that sense can be seen as a rebellious thing to do and a politicized thing to do almost. And I think people don't look at it that way. I think people only view it in the form of thoughts and prayers and then there's inaction. But it's the opposite. Yes, you pray, but there's action immediately that follows, whether that means doing the physical form of prayer, whether that means taking action on a grassroots level, standing with other people, standing up for injustice. And I think the two go hand in hand. I think we often look at prayer as one thing and then justice as something else, but the two are very much tied together.